All right, good afternoon, everyone. I hope everyone is having a fabulous afternoon. Thank you so much for taking part in our first webinar for summer. We are so excited to have Ms. Betsy Weirda with us today. She will be facilitating our next three series of our three-part Seven Habits by Highly Effective Families. So because I don't want to waste any of our time, Betsy, I am going to turn it over to you. Thanks so much. Oh, thank you, Ms. Simmons. How's my audio? Is everyone hearing me okay? Great, great. Wonderful. Welcome. Great. Welcome, everyone. We'd love to have you come on camera if you could. I know many people have lots of obligations and lots of things going on, but if you can come on camera, that would be wonderful to see your faces. Again, I am Betsy Weirda. I'm actually coming to you from Port Charlotte, Florida. It's rainy and storming down here right now, but it is beautiful and such a gift to be in Florida. Um, I am currently working as a coaching consultant with Franklin Covey, and our corporate office is out of Salt Lake City, Utah, but I serve as a coaching consultant in Florida, Georgia, and I'll be adding some schools in Louisiana next year as well. So it's just so wonderful to be with you. We have some beautiful content today that I think you're really going to love, but before we jump into it, one of my colleagues is also here. I think she's driving, but maybe she'll be able to say hello. June, are you with us? You're on mute, June. You're on mute, friend. I'm here. Yeah. Sorry, you just put me on the spot. Yes, I'm driving. <laughs> <laughs> I did. June, will you tell us what you do with the Franklin Covey organization? Oh, sure. Um, I work with school districts and schools, helping support them with their needs. And um, I have the pleasure of getting to meet wonderful people such as yourself on Zoom and in person. And um, I'm sure all the details aren't needed, but <laughs> wanted to say thanks for being here. And I look forward to um, this series with you guys. Yes, and thanks, June, for that. And it will be a series. This is part one. And again, we just have about 58 minutes where we're going to be talking together. So I'm going to be sharing content with you that you will just love. And what I really want from you, parents and, and families, is your input, your thoughts around the content, your thoughts about maybe using some of this in your homes and in your lives. So if you don't feel comfortable coming off mute, please feel free to use the chat box below. And Ms. Simmons is going to help me monitor that chat box. In fact, Ms. Simmons, you can just stop me and say, hey, Betsy, stop talking. We have some other people who want to say something. So um, let's use that chat box. And I will also invite you to come off mute and, and talk with us as well. So are we ready to start? Everybody ready? Woo, let's get this party started. And let's talk about families. Wow families. Um, yeah, they're not always easy, right? But they're also really, really wonderful. So just a little background about me. I'm a former special education teacher and um, I taught primarily in Jacksonville, Florida. And I taught in urban schools with children, um, middle schoolers who were in and out of the prison system. That's the, the majority of my years in education. I also was a principal and worked at a district office in St. John's County, that's St. Augustine area. Um, but my best job by far has been a mom, being a mom. Um, for our moms here, I, I'm sure you can agree, it's not only wonderful, but the most difficult job as well. Can anybody hear me out there now? All right. I've got some heads shaking. And you know, it's that kind of job that you don't punch in and out, right? It's 24 hours a day. And even when like they're 18 and maybe they're out of the house, you're still a mom. So in fact, right now I'm sitting in my daughter's house. She's 35 and I'm helping her with her two children as her husband's in Houston on a business trip. So motherhood or parenthood or, you know, the family, it's forever. And so we need to learn how to navigate that, right? Not only to keep our sanity, but so that our families will thrive and so that we can become the most effective people that we can be. Are we agreed? All right. So there's going to be some things that you're going to want to write down. If you don't have a piece of paper or a notebook and a pen, you might want to grab that. I think you'll love some of this. Also, I want you to feel free when we meet these three sessions to do two things. All right. One would be to invite others to register for our next session. And the other thing would be to use your phone and capture these slides on camera. If there's anything you want to grab and hold on to and think about and reflect on before our next session, feel free to do that. We'd love to have you capture it with your camera. Does that sound good? 
Okay. Um, depending on who comes on camera, because I don't see a lot of faces, we may or may not do breakout rooms. Again, some of you are multitasking, I understand. So we'll kind of stop midway and I'll probably ask you, Ms. Simmons, if you think we should do breakout or just stay with the direct teach. How does that sound? All right, guys, so let's get started. Ooh, let's take a look at this quote from Dr. Stephen Covey. What do you think, families? Truth? Yeah. Everything starts at home, right? Our society begins at home. No pressure on us parents, right? Um, by the way, Dr. Covey is the author of the book called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. It was written in 1989, and it was typically used or previously used in the corporate world. And now we're bringing it into schools and teaching these habits, these wonderful seven habits to students, students of all ages, and now to families. And again, sharing this wonderful content with you. So let's take a look at this. You know that all families are different. We're not here to define families. You define your own family, right? Each family is unique. And so just for a few minutes, I'd like you to think about yourselves. In fact, if I didn't say this earlier, a lot of this training is for you. How can you be more effective in your family? How can you help your family unit and support your family unit and your kids? And so the first way to do that is to reflect here inside. So we're going to use the chat box um, since we don't necessarily have a piece of paper in front of us, although some of you are taking notes. And if we could use the chat box and just write down one word, this one word should depict your strength. What is your strength just as a human being? Professionally, personally, what's your strength? All right, go ahead and put it in the chat right at the bottom. And Ms. Simmons, you tell me what people are saying. Okay, so we have Miss Rose saying kind. Miss Davis. Uh, let's see, Liliana, uh, proactive. Nice. Nicole, determined. I am going to say understanding. <laughs> nice. We have Jemaya focus. All right, that's what I'm seeing right now. Okay, and friends, feel free to write in the chat uh, anytime you want to ask any questions as we go along, or again, come off mute and jump in and just say, hey, I have a question or a comment. Um, I like the word determined. I think that was my favorite. And I think about being a parent, you know, we have to be de determined and strong and patient and kind. We've got little people in our care that we're raising up to go out and impact the world. At least that's our hope, right? So I'd love for someone to come off you and, and just share, what do you really want for your kids as you think about them in the future? What do you want for them? Who would like to share? Anybody courageous enough? What do you want for your kids? Hi. Hi, Ms. Davis Walker. Hi, I would like for my children to be successful in whatever way they feel they can be successful. Mm. As long as they're happy and they can um, be educated, and be able to survive in the world. Beautiful. What a beautiful parent you are. So supportive, right? Wherever they find I their do. strength and their happiness, um, that's where they need to be, right? And that's how they'll define success. You're not going to, as a parent, define it for them. Man, that's awesome. Anybody want to add to that? Hi. Um, I do not have video. Let's see. Oh, that's okay. Okay. I'm oh, here. You are. Yeah. Yes. yes. Uh, I'm here as a teacher, as a mother and a grandmother. I was very interested about the this activity uh, because I think that first I consider myself a lifelong learner. So yes. I'm here like I, I'm already a grandma, uh, seven and four years old, but also I work as a teacher for BPK 
four years old, four and five years old. So I think that adults, we have lots of things to offer, provide to the kids. And I want to show, to be the, the example of, like I said, proactive and try, never give up, uh, expose, ex provide exposure to plenty of activities so they can choose what they really want and what they really like and encourage them, not only judge them or say you have to do this, but be their supporter and guidance. Beautiful, that's beautiful. And I have to commend you, um, running around with four-year-olds all day. Um, yes, kudos to you, that's amazing. <laughs> um, by the way, I'm a grandmother of four toddlers as well. And you know, no easy feat. I can't imagine 20 of them every day. So congratulations to you for that. Thank you. And thank you for what you're providing to all the kids in your life, right? And so here's my task for you because I want you to walk away from each session, friends, with some homework, all right? Some things to try out with your family. Are you up for it? Okay, all right, I see some heads. All right, we're gonna have courage here as parents. We have to, right? So number one, three. number one, ask your family, have a family meeting. You know, even if your kids are grumbling, if they're teenagers and they're like, I don't want a family meeting, because that's what mine did. Have them come and sit in a room, put away the social media for five minutes or 10 minutes and just sit around and say, I just want to know, I went to this workshop today and they asked us what our strength was. So I just want to know, what do you guys think your strengths, strengths are? What do you think? Let's just go around and share. Then I'll let you go back to your, whatever, your social media, but we're going to have a little family meeting. All right. So if we did this, say that you take on this homework assignment tonight and you ask your family members their strengths, what do you think that would do for your family? Just a 10 minute meeting. What would it do for your family? Anybody? It'll definitely provide time together. Miss Simmons, you're seeing where I'm going here. Because throughout these three sessions, I'm going to be bringing topics up over and over again. I'll overdwell a little bit. And you might get sick of me saying, hey guys, why don't we have a family meeting? Or why don't you get together with your kids and your family tonight? I have to tell you as a strategy, number one isn't really about strengths. It's about family meeting. And we did it when our kids were little and up through teenage years. Really our reason, our purpose was just to get, kind of get our schedule straightened out. Like who's doing what Sunday through Sunday. So let's meet Sunday night before bed. Let's figure out who's going to make dinner, who's driving people where. So that's how it started. And then it turned out into, it turned into more of a sharing time. And, um, you know, I was a teacher, so I had to bring in my teacher stuff. So I would say things like, hey, what was the best part of your day? Instead of what did you do at school today? Because you know what we get when we ask that? Right. Nothing. So we have two additional comments in the chat. So I just want to let you know, Sheena Lofton says to celebrate the things we do well. I love that. And Ms. Rose Smith said, make them think about being a part of the family. Wonderful yeah. comments. Yeah. So there's, so I love those because there's something about the gathering, right? And so number one, start this idea of family meeting. And we call it in our work at Franklin Covey, a cadence of accountability, but really what it is, is just a habit. Let's meet every Sunday, guys. Let's chat, see what you're doing, ask some open-ended questions. So they have to answer them. You know, what was, what was the toughest part of today? What was the, the greatest part of today? We used to call that sweet and low. What was your sweet? What was your low? Come on. You're not leaving this room and going back to social media till you tell me. All right, so there's a strategy for you. And I think we have something else in the chat, Ms. Simmons. Can you take a look real quick? I saw it lighting up, I was so excited. No? Nope, okay, all right. Somebody gave it a second thought. So we're starting with this idea of family meeting because what we really wanna do, and even if your family is amazing, is to go from great to greater right? We want to build a nurturing family culture where our kids feel safe, where they can talk to us, where they feel listened to, 
you know, not, none of us are going to be perfect parents. I wasn't, I still am not, um, you know, I can look back and think of all the mistakes I made. Um, but my goal is just to get better every day, especially as my kids get older, my kids are in their twenties and thirties now. And so we're more of, uh, we're becoming friends, right. Um, more so than that mom, you know, boss kind of figure. So the nurturing piece is so important, especially when we want our kids to talk to us. Hey, parents, I don't know about you. I grew up in the eighties. I wouldn't want to grow up right now. I mean, sometimes I don't like, you know, being 57, but on the other hand, it's hard out there. It's hard to navigate middle school. I work with high schools. In fact, I've worked with Fort Pierce Westwood Prep High School, one of the toughest schools and most wonderful schools out there. And the kids have gone through a lot. I'm sure you know that. Would anybody like to add to that? Just, you know, maybe there's a mom of a teenager or a dad or a family member of a teenager out there. Anybody want to add to that statement of, hey, it's tough out there for our kids? Any thoughts? I can say it's very difficult, especially when you have a child who is uh, a lesbian. So, Yep. It's very difficult. And also her being in middle school was very difficult for her. Mm. So it was very tough. A lot of crying wow. and uh, a lot of depression. Mm. But um, since she's been in high school, it's been great this year. Yeah. And um, but we do a, a lot of hugging, a lot of playing with one another, sitting on my lap. And just, and her father and I just talking. We do a Beautiful. lot of talking about the situations and what's going on. Beautiful. What a great support system, right? Yes. And so this is what I'm seeing Ms. Davis Walker and friends. And this is just my experience in working with schools over the past 36 years. I'm seeing that our high schoolers are a lot more accepting and embracing and um, engaging definitely more than 20 years ago. And I'm seeing even a difference. And I think you mentioned it, Ms. Davis Walker, that there's a difference between middle school and high school. There's just a developmental maturity and this acceptance and this more of, um, not tolerance, embracing of diversity and um, just kind of getting excited about people's differences, which has been really beautiful to see at the high school level. Are you seeing that as well? Yeah. And I, I don't think that happens out of the air. I think it takes parents like yourself. I think it takes really great teachers and wonderful administrators and um, people who just understand that every single child has genius and every single child can change the world. So thanks for being transparent and sharing that and the importance of that nurturing environment. So here's your quiz. What are the three common purposes of a family? By the way, you can't really get this wrong. This is just something to think about. Now, Ms. Simmons, this is where I was going to put people into a breakout, but I'm wondering if we should just stay with direct teach because most I folks think that's are fine. Okay. Yes. Sounds good. All right. So we'll just kind of stick with this and have a group talk and feel free to come off mute and jump in or jump into the chat box. What are the three common purposes of a family? Again, there's no right or wrong answers. I just want to hear from you. What are you thinking, friends? I'll give you a minute to write your answers in the chat. Okay, so we have love one another, nurture one another. I think also it's very important to maintain a tradition together or culture. So if we are, we belong to a community or religious or a culture, so maintain that. So it's like being grow together, but maintaining this teaching generation to generations. So important. You know, there's safety and security for our kids in traditions and consistency and structure. Don't you think there's safety for her? Cause they just feel good. I know that my kids will remind me of some of our traditions and I'll think, oh, that's right. I did that with you when you were little. Last night, my granddaughter read me in her little three-year-old words, my favorite book that I read to my kids called Love You, I Love You Forever. If you haven't read that book, 
you have to get your Kleenex friends. It's good. So she was reading this to me in her little three-year-old way. And I was just, Oh, I wish I'd videotaped it for the world. It was so beautiful, but that was a tradition that my daughter taught her. And that I hope goes on because what we really want is to leave a legacy. Don't we? Whether that legacy is kindness or grace or understanding or faith or purpose or hard work or acceptance or diversity, whatever that is, we want to leave our legacy, our positive legacy to our kids. What else do we have, Ms. Simmons? We also have, I'm not sure if I said this one, but to love each other and to be supportive. Um, and Ms. Smith said, support, love, and understanding. Nice stuff, friends. Yes, so wonderful. So I didn't tell you this, but I grew up in New York. That means I'm going to be a little cheeky, okay? <laughs> so I, I look really nice, and I am, but I still want to push your thinking a little bit, parents. So over these three sessions, I'm going to push you to think, and here's your first kind of pushy question. When you think of love and understanding, let's take those answers, for example, all right? Where are you? Like, how are you doing? I think Dr. Phil kind of says that sometimes. Hi, how, how are you doing with that? So if you were to rate yourself like a one through 10, and you don't have to share this. I just want you to reflect. If you had to rate yourself one through 10 on love, where would it be? Where would you be? Most times, you know, we have bad days and good days, but most times, where would you live? One through 10. And then if you had to rate yourself on understanding, or maybe that's a, another word for communication, where would you rate yourself one through 10? So just think about that for a minute. All right. So this is where you get really courageous. Again, you do not have to share. In fact, you don't have to share anything over these three sessions unless you're comfortable. However, I'd love for you to. So would anybody like to share kind of where they are either in the love area, one through 10, or the understanding area? Good, bad, or ugly. Who wants to go for it? Okay, so Ms. Smith said love and eight and understanding in eight. Oh, Ms. Smith, you're good. <laughs> uh, Ms. Davis Walker said 10 in both. Liliana said understanding, listening is seven. Nice. Ms. Sheena Lopin, love and eight, understanding is six. Okay. 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 Typically, friends, when I ask this question to parents, the understanding part's a little bit lower. Why would that be? So let's just think about that for a minute. Well, we're not in high school anymore. So we, we navigated different challenges. Not to say everything was easy breezy when we were growing up, but we're not exactly in their shoes right here in 2021. Number two, and this is my challenge, I'm just speaking from my heart, we're busy. Like we're busy, we're working, whether we're at home or, or outside of the home, we might have other children, other family members, other obligations, we're busy people. So with busyness, sometimes comes a lack of understanding because we want things quick. How was your day? Great, okay, good. Now, what do you want for dinner? Okay, great, let's go through a drive through Okay, what do you have to do tonight? I mean, we get caught up in what we call the whirlwind. And sometimes the understanding doesn't come because of that four letter word in all relationships, T-I-M-E. Mm. Yes. Relationships take time. They take time. So I wanna share something with you and then I'm gonna show you a video, but let me come off share here. And it's what we call the emotional bank account. And you might've heard of it. Sometimes in schools, we call it filling your bucket or bucket fillers. And we learn in our seven habits training. And by the way, you're going to learn all seven habits. Okay. By the time we're done here, but I'm setting it up, setting the stage tonight. We learn in seven habits training that when we have relationships, we need to understand each other's currency. Okay. So Ms. Simmons, I'm going to pretend that you and I are colleagues and we work closely together and it would be really important for us to build trust. And so for us to build trust, I would need to know from you, what's your currency? What, what helps you work more effectively? What aids our communication? So for example, you might need a quiet environment where I'm just not talking all the time. All right. So it would be important for you to tell me that. Or you might need to verbally process things when we have ideas, like we just want to talk it out. I don't want your advice. Just let me talk it out. So I would need to know what fills your bucket. 
Well, we need to do the same thing with our kids, friends. What is the currency of your children? If you're taking notes, write that, that down. And guess what? All you have to do is ask them. They're smart. And, you know, they might say money, <laughs> just give me money and I'll make my bed. All right. That's where you're going to guide them and help them see that this isn't about money. But, you know, your kids are all different. Probably if you have multiple kids, I know mine were. I have one child who really loved affirmation. You're doing a great job, Jenna. You're amazing. People love you at work. And then I have an older daughter and she's like, don't, I don't want to hear all that. Just help me fold the laundry. Okay. Right. And then, you know, my son is more about just show up. Mom, I just want you to be here. That was what filled his bucket. Does that make sense, everybody? All right. What do you think about that idea of emotional bank account with our, with our children? Somebody talk to me. What are you thinking? Somebody jump in. So I will chime in. I think that's a phenomenal idea. You know, we each, we all have our, our love language. And I think it's important for us to find out what that is. And someone just said that we use five love languages. Um, and I think that's an awesome activity to do with your children if they're older, because we want to know, you know, how can we love and, and cater to their love language most effectively. That's right. I, I like how you said that, Simmons. You know, everything's um, developmentally, right, appropriate or not. And so sometimes we just need to change our verbiage. <laughs> Alicia, I like that. She said you said what she was going to say, Ms. Simmons. <laughs> um, you know, and sometimes we just need to know and remember that we don't always see our kids as others see them. Did you ever run into anybody like at church or in the grocery store and they said, oh my goodness, your daughter's so polite. We love her. And you're thinking, what? My daughter? Are you so sure? Something else that was added to the chat. It says we also tend to give love the way we want to receive it. Oh, our sorry. kids may need something different. Right. And that's that from Miss Lofton. And that's why we need to talk to them because we might see them as little mini us, like my little mini Betsy's. And so I'm going to see them like me. They're going to have my dreams. They're going to have my goals. They're going to do what I want. And I love how Miss Davis Walker said, I support my children's needs and desires and dreams. And so I'm going to show you a video and it's around paradigms. And we use the word paradigms um, to really depict how we see things. Are we clear about how we see our kids? You know, I think about how angry we can get at our children sometimes, and yet the phone rings, we're in the middle of yelling at our kids, and the phone rings, and we can do this on the flip of a switch. Hello? Hi, how are you? You know, I mean, that's just, if we can do that, we can take the time needed to really get to see our kids for who they are. And if you don't know your own children's gifts and talents, it's not too late. You can have those conversations. So I'm going to share my screen with you show you a video on paradigms, and then we're gonna talk about it. I think you're really gonna like it. If you would, Ms. Simmons, just give me a thumbs up when the volume comes on to make sure that everyone hears the audio, okay? All right, I'll be looking for your thumb. And here we go. So much of what we do in our personal lives and at the office is the result of the paradigms we hold. And what we do, in turn, affects the results we get. Thanks for coming to the meeting today, everyone. The word paradigm comes from the Greek root paradigma, meaning pattern. The pattern we expect to see, or the mental image of the way things are. We see everything through the perspective of our own paradigm. What we see, our paradigms, determine what we do, which in turn determines what we get. And unless we consciously stand apart from and examine our paradigms, we might never see that perhaps many of them are distorted short-sighted, or just flat out wrong. 
I remember a mini paradigm shift I experienced one Sunday morning on a subway in New York City. People were sitting very quietly, some reading, some resting with their eyes closed. Suddenly, a man and his children entered the subway car. The children ran yelling to the car, throwing things, grabbing people's newspapers. Their father sat down near me and closed his eyes and did nothing. I felt irritated. I could not believe he would let his children run wild like that. After a few minutes of patience and restraint, I turned to him and said, Sir, your children are really disturbing a lot of people. I wonder if you could control them just a little more. Yeah, you're right. I should do something. But we just came from the hospital where their mother died about an hour ago, and I guess they don't know how to handle it. I guess I don't know how to handle it. Can you imagine how I felt at that moment? My paradigm shifted. Suddenly I saw things differently. And because I saw differently, I thought differently. I felt differently. I acted differently. My irritation vanished. Compassion flowed freely. I wanted to help instead of criticizing and complaining. Once you see things as they really are, you'll think, feel, and act differently. And you'll do it automatically, spontaneously. If you want to make minor changes in your life, work on your behavior. But if you want to make significant quantum breakthroughs, work on your paradigms. Wow. Ooh, I remember seeing that for the first time and I actually teared up. That's a true story. That's Dr. Stephen Covey who wrote the book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Um, you know, as a teacher, I know we have some teachers here as well. I remember sometimes getting frustrated with some students. I wasn't the perfect teacher. And I would train myself to say, Betsy, what are his gifts and talents? What are his gifts and talents? I know she's got some in there. All right, so I'm going to give you homework assignment number two. If you're taking notes, here we go. Number two, sit down tonight with a journal or a pen, some paper, and just put your kid, kids' names down or maybe all your family members' names down. And this can be just between you or you can do this in a family meeting and you write their gifts and talents down. Now you've already had that, that family meeting where they say, hey, this is my strength. I think I'm really good at being kind or I'm patient with my little brother because he drives me nuts, that kind of thing. Now it's your turn to reflect. Put your family members' names down and just write down their gifts and talents and bring that mindset, that paradigm back when things get tough because things do get tough. I mean, think of it, friends. We, we live together in houses, in buildings with these people called our family. It's not easy. We're sharing stuff like toothpaste. This is hard. What are your thoughts about this or about the video? I'd love to hear your thoughts. Anything in the chat or you can come off mute. <laughs> Sheena, thank you. Yeah, and keep that paper with you, right? When you get really stressed out with your kids, you bring that back out. I know Billy Bob's got a gift and talent. Better find it before I get really upset, right? What else? Any other thoughts about the video or the assignment? You know, I immediately thought about coming off of a year of dealing with the pandemic. And that's something that I continually told the families that I work with. You know, we have to show a lot of grace right now. And I think that's something that we'll continue doing and we need to continue doing. Um, it's just showing grace to each other, our students, our, our children, you know, our significant others. Um, it's really important. Alicia placed in the chat, perception is important. Mm -hmm. How we think things are may not always be the right way. I love that. Oh, that is good. Yeah, we make assumptions. We make assumptions with people. We make assumptions with our kids, right? And, and we find frustration with our kids when we make assumptions. Do you, do you do that? Sometimes we assume they were somewhere and they weren't, or they did something and they didn't, and they can cause so much frustration. Anybody? 
Ms. Lofton says, focus on the donut, not the hole. Our kids have wonderful gifts and talents that we can amplify. Beautiful. Oh, that is so good. I like that. I'm taking that with me. Thank you for that. Oh, I'm going to digress just a little bit and show you something because you mentioned the pandemic, Ms. Simmons, and um, it's been about a year and a half now, really, when we think about it. Educationally speaking, I don't know if you knew this, parents, but over um, the United States, our kiddos overall, research says, have lost over nine months of academic instruction and sometimes over nine months of academic achievement. You know, maybe not your kids specifically, but statistics show that we're, we're in trouble. We've had a real learning loss out there. That's number one. The other thing that we've seen out there um, due to this pandemic and other things, come on, there's other things going on out there. Social injustice, the George Floyd situation. And friends, here's what we know, the TV's been on. I mean, it's on at my house a lot. And we can't shield our kids from everything. And then there's, let's throw in some nasty politics, right? Our kids have been through a lot. And so what research says is that our children and us have been through trauma. Now that sounds pretty dramatic, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Can you read what's in the chat? I'm loving it. Yes, that. I would love to. Miss Liliana says, be aware of our beliefs, our judgments in order to understand others or just listening to others. And she also wrote acceptance. Yeah, well, she's ahead of the game. She's on session number two already. Awesome. That's, that's habit five, right? So hold that <laughs> before we get into the habits. And, and again, we only have about 20 minutes left, but I want to just show you what we've been through as human beings. And, you know, we have at least one commonality, probably many, many more, but one is that we're all human beings. And here it is. We've been through change. So research says when change happens as human beings, we go into what we call the zone of disruption. And our lives are turned upside down for whatever reason, an external force such as the pandemic, right? And as human beings, we, we flee, it's fight or flight, or we go into a zone of adoption, we adopt or adapt to the change. And hopefully we go into what we call this zone of innovation, where we can be better than we were before, where something creative and inspiring, a silver lining can come out of the pandemic or any other thing that happens to us. So we're just going to stop right here. And I just want you to think about not only us, but our kids and what they've been through, because everybody in the world, like we have this global connection now that everybody in the world has gone through this pandemic. It's scary, but it's also unifying when we think about it. So here's my question, parents, what have the silver linings been for us as families from the pandemic or from this last year and a half? What, what are the silver linings? Either share in the in the chat or come off mute. What do you think the silver linings are? For my family, the silver lining has been more time together. Um, more so, you know, in the beginning of the pandemic when everything kind of slowed down. Um, I was really appreciative of having that one-on-one -on -one time with them and really getting to know what's important to them, what they need. And um, it really helped me kind of see where I was lacking as a parent um, and what I can do to try to give them what they need, not just during the pandemic, but moving forward. Yeah, Sheena, I hear your little kiddos in the background. It's so sweet. You know what? I've heard so many people all over the country say that we, we had family dinners again. <laughs> Remember those? Mm -hmm. We sat at the table when the table wasn't like our office and all their homework and the backpacks. It was actually like a dinner table. We brought that back in our house too. I had two grown kiddos living with me at that time and um, we cooked every night. It's like really fun, less expensive. So who That's else? True. So <laughs> we also have in our comments, Nicole Romagna stated, appreciating what we already have and not worrying about what we don't have. So true. Gratitude, right? Woo, gratitude. I mean, you know, for those who've lost their jobs, it's been tough. Some of us know people who have been impacted directly via COVID. And so there's so much gratitude for the little things. Anybody else, a silver lining? All right, homework assignment. Are we on three or four, Ms. Davis Walker? I'm just filling you up with homework. Three, yeah, okay, it's three. All right, here's number three. And this is just considerations, friends. And I'm talking to myself too, by the way. Um, not a perfect parent for sure. Bring back the family dinner, maybe even if it's just once a week. 
Um, I think there's beauty in that. Just like Sheena was saying, you know, just stopping and breathing and getting to know our kids and our family members again. What do you think? Just one time? Maybe some of you are really good at that. And that's awesome. Um, I know I wasn't. And still, even today, it's like, hey, with my husband or my older kids, if they're around, grab the plate, let's sit in front of the TV. Let's be entertained. You know, there's just some beauty about turning it off. <laughs> Any thoughts? Okay. So reminder, we've all been through trauma. Okay. We've been through some stuff. Any other comments about that? All right, let's think about how we can continue to help our kids, right? Navigate Ooh, some stuff out there. I'm gonna show you another slide. One of the things that we can do with our kids is to use what we call proactive language, all right? Now, some of you know the seven habits and you know that habit one is be proactive. We teach this to our kids in our schools and it's so fun, even our littlest kids, like our little little three-year-olds can say, I want to be proactive. I'm in charge of me. And then our older kids learn to be proactive. It means you carry your own weather. You, um, you can rise above difficult circumstances. You can leave a legacy and become a transition person to others by the way you act or respond versus react. So this really has to do with brain research. I'll stay with me on this. This is interesting. And you might think at first, this is a little corny, but there's brain research to this. And it's about how we speak to ourselves and to others. So homework number four tonight, now don't be too weird about it, but you're going to use proactive language with your families. All right, if I could, Miss Simmons, get a thumbs up. I wanna know that you can hear this. And if you can't, we'll go back and try it again. Take a look. There's nothing I can do. I can't change. It's impossible. It's just the way I am. I can't. I have to. If only they... Our paradigms are both revealed and shaped by the words we use. If we see ourselves as powerless, it shows up in our language. Phrases like I can't, I have to, it's impossible, reveal our belief that we have no choice. And what's worse, they reinforce that belief. However, if we see ourselves as capable and able to affect change in our lives, this also shows up in our language. Proactive phrases like I can, I choose to, I will, show that we are not victims of our circumstances. More importantly, they reinforce that paradigm, allowing us to think and act in more powerful and effective ways. Reactive language can be very damaging to our lives. The latest research shows that negative reactive language actually releases dozens of stress-producing hormones and neurotransmitters in our brains, powerfully affecting our moods, reasoning, and communication. When we use reactive language, we feel worse about our possibilities and ourselves. Because it limits our thinking, reactive language often becomes a negative, self-fulfilling prophecy where we act in ways that justify our belief, creating a downward spiral of personal powerlessness. Reactive language also shapes how others see us. If we use the language of powerlessness, others see us as powerless, as victims of our circumstances, and as unable to move forward in challenging situations. As a result, we lose their confidence and trust. Proactive language, however, is entirely different. Research suggests that when we change the words we use to proactive rather than reactive language, we can actually alter our brain's chemistry and functioning in positive, helpful ways. We actually feel better and think better when we use proactive language. Consistent proactive language affirms our capacity to choose. It reflects and reinforces a proactive approach to life. It's a solutions mindset that creates an upward spiral of more effective thinking, doing, and results. Ultimately, proactive language lets others know that we do not see ourselves as victims of circumstances. Their confidence in us grows and they are more willing to lend us their support and energy. 
it helps us move from impasse to insight and action. Proactive language is the language of leadership. By choosing the words we use, language becomes a powerful tool of effectiveness. Proactive language opens our minds to the space between stimulus and response. It allows us to see the possibilities, to alter our circumstances, increase our influence, and ultimately to improve our lives. Wow. Woo. That's convicting for me. I can sometimes get caught up in negativity, especially when things are negative. And, you know, some of us, maybe most of us have been a victim of something in our lives. And we know that bias is real. And we know that we've all been through some things. And so to become negative is easy, especially when things are tough. So this habit, proactivity, helps us and our kids understand that they can rise above. It doesn't negate the fact that things have happened. We have kids who are victims, right? So it doesn't take away that. What it says is, you know what? You don't have to stay here. (laughs) You, You just don't have to stay. You can get out. And whether the get out is physical or the get out is just mental and emotional through proactive language, that's what we want to help our kids do. So give me your thoughts. Either someone come up mute, put it in the chat. What are you thinking after you saw that video? What's on your mind? Anybody? Ms. Simmons? I don't see anything in the chat yet, but something that, you know, in this last year that my husband and I really tried to be very uh, purposeful about is, you know, we were still working through the pandemic and some days it would be a lot. It would be a lot, but you have your children, they're watching how you respond. So we really made a conscious effort of making sure that regardless of what we had going on with work or other things that are going on in the world, we wanted our children to see us in a positive mindset. Um, not to try to shelter them from the negative, but we knew how important, we know how important it is to try to make sure that one, they feel safe, they feel protected, and that they are able to see us as parents happy. Um, So that is something I just love the the idea of just dealing with the power of positivity. Because they will then do the same thing. They will focus on being positive and not accentuating the negative which is hard. I have a 13 year old at home and um, she can get caught up in that world every now and then. (laughs) You're right. You're right. We learn what we live, right? Did you ever look in the mirror and and say, oh my goodness, I've become my mother. I not only look like her, I'm I'm her. I'm I'm acting like her, right? Right. Which can be good or sometimes not. Um, But yeah, we do learn what we live. We live what we learn. And you said the word power, Ms. Simmons. And here's what we teach our children when we talk about habit one, that there's a space, and this is that brain research part, between stimulus and response. There's a literal 10 second space where we can choose to be proactive or reactive. We can respond or react. Oh, Liliana put something there. We read that? Yes. Ms. Ms. Liliana states being reactive does not help anybody, not ourselves or how we interact with others. Being proactive means have hope, but we have to work to accomplish our goals and be grateful. Wonderful. So beautiful. Yes. Yeah. I've been a principal for many, many years of different schools. And I've noticed the teachers who have the most challenges with classroom management are those who are reactive. Now listen to this. The reactive teachers, you won't be surprised by this, parents. The reactive teachers are the ones with the least amount of trust with the kids and the lowest level of relationship. And so part of my work around the country, which I love, is to talk to educators and parents about relationships. Like the academics will come. But you know, Rita Pearson said this. If you haven't seen Rita Pearson's TED Talk from 90, 1994, she said this. She's a renowned educator who said, kids don't work for teachers they don't like. It's the same in families. We have to build trust with our kids through those habits of modeling, being responsive, not reactive, and not 100%, you know, and it's okay to say, I'm sorry, or to tell your kids, you know, I blew it. Did you see how I reacted when that guy pulled out in front of me? Man, that made me mad. And to just talk through and to have that honesty and transparency. 
Anybody else have some thoughts about proactivity or anything? What's on your mind? All right, Ms. Davis Walker, I see your beautiful face. Anything you're thinking about there, friend? No good, very good. Okay, well, we're gonna talk about you. Remember, I told you, this is about you. One of the ways, one of the additional ways besides proactive language to ensure that we're modeling strength, right? And response, not reactiveness is right here. Parents, we are not good at this. I'm just being, I'm being honest, we stink. Why, <laughs> for lack of a better word, why are we bad at this? Let's put it in the chat. Why can't we just once in a while put ourselves first? Let's have some answers in the chat, friends, or come off mute. Well, someone was calling me for an answer, but we'd rather go to the chat box. So what do we have, Ms. Simmons? We are always taking care of everyone else. Yes, yes, we are too focused on our family. Um, I typed in the word time. There's not enough time, it feels like sometimes. <laughs> yeah, beautiful. Anybody else? Why, why can't we take care of ourselves? Okay, let me throw out some other ideas. How about guilt? Come on. If we don't take that egg dish to the church breakfast, somebody's gonna get mad. Come on, friends, we are not in middle school. We need to learn how to say no, parents, people, families. No to what's good and yes to what's best. Is something else in the chat, Ms. Simmons? I think there might be something else there. Someone just said true. That is very true. <laughs> you know, it doesn't happen overnight. I was one of those people pleasers. I think it took until I was about 40 years old. And, you know, some kind of craziness with my mother-in-law. But I just decided, hey, enough, enough. Boundaries are healthy. And you become healthier when you have boundaries. Here's how you become really healthy. When on your calendar each week, you're on it. Here's homework assignment number five, six or something. Take a look at your calendar. And if you understand that you can only live your purpose and leave a legacy by being well, you're going to put yourself on your calendar. And what are you going to put on the calendar? Well, let's take a look at this slide, friends, and feel free to snap a picture of this. Where do you need to spend time? As whole people, as human beings, we have four dimensions. Our body, how we take care of ourselves physically, our heart, that's our, our relationships, and our relationship with ourselves. Some of us love a lot of people, but don't even love ourselves. What about our spirit, our sense of value and purpose, and being connected to something greater than ourselves, whether it's a vision or a mission or our work or faith, right? And then what about our mind? Are we learning? Are we growing? Right? So this is what Dr. Covey says when we teach the seven habits, that we should take time for ourselves in each one of these areas every week to become the whole person, the healthiest version of ourselves so that we can live our purpose well. Woo! Now that's a lot of thinking right there. Can you imagine putting four hours on your calendar for you? <laughs> Ms. Davis, you are like, no way. And maybe, okay, let me be realistic because I don't have little kids at home anymore. Maybe you can't. Maybe it's a half an hour. Maybe it's just here. You take the kids. I need 30 minutes to just walk. Put on your music that you love. Let's talk. Wh where do you need to work? Like, where's the place where you need to really improve? Who would like to share? Maybe a struggle. Love to have you come off mute and share someplace that you struggle or put it in the chat. So someone said exercising. I believe it was Tamara Carruthers. Yeah. Yeah, it's tough. I'm right there with her. <laughs> yeah, I'm thinking about my day to day. I usually, um, when I, I'm home in the office, I usually put in some 10 minute walks. I haven't even done that today. Marquia Bird said self worth. Yes. Ooh. I think that first we need to accept ourselves and do things for ourselves. Then 
put ourselves first and constantly doing things for others to please others, even at work or in the house. So it's. Oh, so glad you said that. And that's hard to accept because we're nurturers. We love our families. Many of us have, have jobs outside of the home and many of us just really put our hearts and souls into that as well. And yet if we keep going and going and going, we're going to burn out. And so I want you to think about this tonight as part of your homework, that that's image. It. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I just want to say, I do have a difficult time doing things for myself because I do work outside the, the home. I'm also was in, um, in two universities. Wow. So I'm in grad school and two and doing in two different colleges. So that is very difficult to find time for myself. So yes. it's very difficult and I never get a chance to do any of anything for myself. Even now during the summer, um, I'm helping somebody else. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's, so that's, that's part of who you are, right? Yes. You're, you're a giver and a nurturer. So yeah, I remember being in grad school and all that craziness. So um, I'm going to push you, Miss Davis W. I'm going to push you. Of course, you don't have time. I'm going to push you to create it. And I want you to think about it between now and we get back together on July 8th. How can you create 30 minutes? Maybe it's Saturday afternoon and you just take a walk or go to a movie or just it's your me time go to a restaurant and have a meal by yourself I love doing that I love doing that too but I am taking time for myself so I'll be away from my home for two weeks what? and going to be with my mother oh. while my daughter and my husband are at home that's lovely that's lovely. All right. Just remember, sometimes you need a little space from the mom too. So you take care of yourself while you're there. All right. All right, friends. So I hope you took a picture of this. I think it's just such a, a great reminder of us as whole people, right? Um, Miss Simmons, I'm going to put you on the spot here and stop sharing. I'm going to pull up our closing video today. I'd love to have you share and then people share in the chat box. What are you taking away today from this very short, but I hope meaningful session? What are you taking away as a parent? So many things. Uh, Miss Betsy, as I was telling you, I'm a mom of three and their ages are 13, 10, and three. Um, so there's a, a great big uh, gap in there of age. However, journaling is something that I am really going to, I used to do it and I want to do more. Um, I'm looking forward to, we have not consistently, we used to have family meetings. So I'm really excited about having the family meeting and having them talk about, you know, what they feel uh, their gifts and their talents are. I'm super excited about that. Um, I'm sorry. So I am going to identify what their gifts and talents are. I want, I'm glad to be able to ask them about what their strengths are. Um, the family dinner, I'm so happy that I can say that probably four out of seven nights a week, we do sit down and eat dinner together. So I, I do work very hard to make sure that that happens, but we do. It. And it's, it's so valuable. You know, even if my husband isn't home, at least the kids and I do it. Um, and it's great time for conversation, no technology. We're just sitting at the table eating and having great conversation. Great. Um, and I am going to put, literally, I'm going to figure out how to put at least two hours a week on the calendar for myself. I'm mm -hmm. going to start there. I don't think I can start right at four. <laughs> I'm going to start with two. <laughs> That's awesome. I, I just wanted Miss Davis Walker to do 30 minutes. So this is good. <laughs> this is good. You know? No, oh, this is great. You. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for sharing, guys. Again, our next session is July 8th. Don't go anywhere. I just want to leave with one quick video. It's really, really fast. If you can stay, please watch it. It's called The Hidden Story. And um, as we're taking care of ourselves, just remember somebody talked about having grace. Remember to have empathy and grace for others because we're all going through something. Again, we've all been through trauma, our kids, as well as our family members. And let me take you back to one thing, the emotional bank account. You know how I said deposits, it's important to deposit and find our, our family's currency. Also be really careful of taking withdrawals, withdrawals from our family. And do you know who we withdraw from the most? The people who are closest to us. We are sometimes more kind and more generous and nurturing to the people we work with than we are to the people in our own home. 
because we know that they're going to love us unconditionally. So make some deposits over the next few weeks. Um, again, I'll see you on the 8th, but take a look at this video on empathy. I think you're really going to love it. Again, Ms. Simmons, if you could give me a thumbs up, if we can hear it. And then I wish you a great evening. Thank you, everybody. Ms. Simmons, do you have any parting words for us? Yes, thank you so much. Uh, I, I've seen that video and I get choked up every time, so excuse me. Um, but thank you to everyone that took time out of their day to participate in this webinar. In the chat, I placed our next session is going to take place on July 8th. I will be sure to share again via email the webinar link to sign up for that particular um, our next, our part two. Also, we have materials that are in route to us to provide you all with. I have placed my email in the chat. So if you can please just send me an email if possible. It is Simmons, K-E-O, that's S-I-M-M-O-N-S, K-E-O at PCSB.org. Please email me the school that your child attends and I will be sure to make sure that the materials are delivered to the school. Um, again, thank you so much. I can't say thank you enough to Ms. Betsy Weirdo. We truly, truly appreciate you. And we look forward to doing this again. Thanks so much. You all have a great evening. Bye, everybody. Thank you.